Hey everybody, hi, it's Kate Richberg live from beadshop.com headquarters here in Redwood City, California. I hope it's a sunny day where you are. Um, it's Wednesday, um, October 26th, right? Oh my gosh, is it the 26th? It's 26th already. I can't believe it. We're almost to the end of October. So thanks so much for joining us for our debut live broadcast. You know, you may have seen me um, post um, a little bit earlier this week. We did a little practice run on Monday um, about doing our live broadcasts. And oh my gosh, you guys, the response was amazing. Thank you so much for all of your really kind comments, your shares, your thoughts. I even got a couple of emails from you guys, which was really, really awesome. So thanks so much for making uh, beadshop.com feel so welcome as we're going live. And it was great to hear from a few students that I had back in the bead shop brick and mortar days. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. It was awesome. So as you guys know, um, as I'm waiting for people to jump on, jump on to join us here, I'll talk a little bit um, about what we're going to be doing today, um, a little bit um, about um, my love of seed beads. I know that's a big collective gasp out there in the bead world. Um, as you know, um, I do, or if you don't know, I'm going to tell you. Um, I do a lot of metalwork, and I'm kind of known, Kate Richburg, jewelry educator, as the metalworking guru. But you guys, back when I started at the bead shop in 1992, beads were actually my first love. So it's pretty cool to come back to my roots um, and share a lot of beady goodness with you guys. You know, the bead shop, um, and now beadshop.com, has been going strong um, since 1982 and since the mid-90s um, as beadshop.com. Um, as you may know, we closed our brick and mortar stores in 2008, but we've been chugging along on the internet ever since. So you guys, that's 34 years of expertise behind um, what we do here at beadshop.com. So I'm super grateful and super happy to be a part of that. Linda Rolson is watching from Colorado. Hey, Doreen Linda. Is in Nevada. Hey, hey, Linda. And who's in Nevada? Doreen. Doreen. Hi, Doreen. Thanks so much for joining me. I hope um, you're going to get a lot of good bead knowledge out of what I'm going to be sharing today. So let me um, show you a little sample I've got here. This is something, you guys, that I made years ago um, with seed beads. And these are beaded beads that um, I made. And this, we're not going to be actually showing you how to make this today, but I thought I'd show you this from kind of my seed bead vault from years past. Um, these are actually beaded beads, and I just used a freeform peyote stitch. And can you see, you guys, I've used a mixture of beads here. I've got some delicas. There's a delica right there, a delica right there. I've got some regular size 11 seed beads, some size eights. And then look, I've got some freshwater pearls. I've got some, that's a little semi-precious piece of tourmaline. Um, and these are all freeform um, peyote stitched around a um, uh, wood bead core. You can see I've got one here as well. You can see I've got some smaller beads. I've actually, I think I've got some size 15s in here, which are, I know that's crazy. Size 15s are so super small. But I've got some larger semi-precious. That's, I think, um, a grossular garnet. Um, this one here, I think, is a smoky topaz. So these beaded beads are a cool way to kind of use up a lot of the bits and bobs that you might have left over from your seed bead, um, you know, your seed bead work. Here's this green one here, again, more freeform stuff. And with these beads, if you're at all familiar with the peyote stitch or freeform peyote, all I do is I start with a ring around the center of the beads, <clears throat> pull it really tight, tie it off, and then start doing my freeform peyote um, to the right and to the left of the center kind of pulling tight and reducing as I go along. You can see that bead, that's just like a little bicone, a little metal bicone that I've got there. Um, these have some little metal, like our shadows beads here. These are actually sterling silver ones from my stash from way back. But you can see the color palette, you can really vary it. And I strung it years ago on Softflex beading wire. 
and I inserted these beautiful kind of caramel colored old um, amber beads there. So um, seed beads and I, oh look at that, that's even a bugle bead. The, the scary bugle bead I used right in here. Um, but you can tell, you know, seed beads um, are great for freeform work, and seed beads have actually kind of been a love of mine for a long time. So it's cool to kind of get back to my roots with those. So that's this one here. So you guys, let's take a look, um, and let's jump into our project, which is looming. So I want to first talk to you a little bit about some threads for looming, okay? And, you know, threads, you guys, is such a personal choice, I think, when it comes to beadwork, not only in looming, but seed beadwork and stringing. So here at beadshop.com, we have a lot of different threads for you to choose from. Today, I'm going to be using Ceylon, which I'm going to talk to you um, in a second about, but I'm going to put these aside because we also have some other fantastic be um, threads that I use for looming. This is a piece by our own webmaster, Karen, and can you see how she used Delica beads in this little loomed bracelet project? And you can kind of see down the sides right here how large the holes of those Delicas are. Um, this is a project that she did on the Jewel Loom, which I think really looks fantastic. She charted out a little pattern and then used these size 11 Delicas. Um, so the pattern is a little more, it's a little smaller and a little more refined. Um, but the threads that you can use with um, these Delicas, this is called Keo, you guys. And Keo is a Japanese um, bead thread that's really um, very firm um, and T I want to say tough, strong, um, and it really holds up to a lot of weaving back and forth between um, the bead holes. If you're familiar at all, you guys, with kind of the old school seed bead thread called Nymo, or even with Fireline, I think that this these are both kind of comparable um, to those. We also have this great, also a Japanese um, beading thread. Um, this is called Hana, and you can see if I hold them up next to one another. The Hana, the hand on the Hana is a little stiffer and the hand on the Ko is a little more fluid. So they both, I think they both work really fantastically. Yeah, question. Someone asks if it's silk. Oh, well that's a really great question. So the nylon thread, Hana is nylon and the Ko actually is also nylon. With silk threads, you guys, silk has a tendency to stretch quite a bit um, because it's a natural fiber. So weaving with silk while at the beginning might be pretty awesome. Um, over time, that piece will stretch out a bit. I reserve silk for things like knotting between my threads, um, pearl knotting, things like that. So nylon thread is a little hardier and has a little less stretch. Um, so the Hana and the Keo both are great. They both come in a wide rainbow of colors. Um, and the needles that you would use with those guys, um, and of course, there's always one thing I forget, so hang on you guys, let me grab it right off the wall here in our, in our um, little fulfillment room. Here we are, bam. The needles that we use, you guys, with these Ko and this Hana thread is uh, these Jewel Loom needles. And you can see, I don't know if you can see through the package. Can they see okay, Grace? Do you think that yeah. is a pretty good shot? I or should I? On All right. Mm -hmm. Let me just, let me be a rebel and um, open these guys up so you guys can see these. These are needles that are specifically made for looming. Okay, now these are open, and if you guys order a package of seed bead loom noodle needles, you may get the one that I opened. So, um, you know, because this is live. Live, live, and off the cuff. Let's see. Let me open this sucker up so you guys can see these. Okay, see here, the looming needles especially. See how long they are? This is, I've got a ruler right here. You can see how long this needle is. It's about 80 millimeters or a little over three inches long. Can you see that? And then take a look, you guys, at the head on this needle. Can you see that there? That, or the eye of the needle, rather. That needle eye, when you push it through, you push it right down on your thread. 
it should reconnect. Are we? Yeah, we're good. Are we good? All yeah, right. Good. All of the perils of going live, you guys. See that right there, how that thread just fits really nicely on the eye of that needle. So something like this is perfect, this needle, for these size 11 seed beads here. Okay, and it's long, so you can do long rows of looming. It's perfect. Come on in, Janice. Look at you guys. Janice just got to work. It's oh, 1030, and she's coming up the stairs because she's been busy working at home all day. It huh? It's good. Say hi, yeah. everybody, JP. Hi. All hi, right. Everyone. All right. Isn't it great having Kate back? Oh, it's so oh, good I'm to so be back. Excited. It's good to I'm be so back. Excited. Alrighty. So, yeah. Now we'll get back to teaching it. everybody. So I'm teaching. Mm. Well, I'm teaching the looming, and oh, I'm fun. sharing our new looming seed bead needles. Oh, so, great! Yes. Aren't they wonderful? And you're going to see. I've made a special offer to people that are going to be at the. It's going to be at the end of our broadcast that even Janice doesn't know about. So oh. I hope I won't get in trouble. <laughs> oh, it's okay. We'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hi everyone. Keep All right. on. All right. Okay. Hey, we're going to keep forging on. Alrighty. So. That was a treat, wasn't it? Oh, it's great. You know, our office is here. So super cozy, and sometimes it feels like we're all on top of each other. But it is cool to kind of be all together and, and be creative together. So let's take a look at our next threads, our next um, threads and uh, needles that we're going to use. So let me push that aside. And let me pull these to the fore. So you guys, this is Ceylon. Um, and, you know, I love nylon threads and working with nylon threads. When I string long beaded necklaces or multi-strand necklaces, I Ceylon is my go-to. And we carry it in three different weights. We carry it in micro, we carry it in regular, and we carry it in fine. And I did those out of order. It goes micro, fine, and regular. Those are the three sizes. Micro being the smallest, regular being the largest. Um, and I actually use this in the sample that I'm going to be showing you since the beads, since the shadows that we're using, they're metal and they're a little larger, we're going to go with a little bit of a larger thread. Um, you know, there's a really helpful, um, on our projects page, if you go to our skill builders, I think it's on skill builders, isn't it? Our stitchinary is under skill builders. Um, at beadshop.com the ladies put together this amazing reference guide um, it's called our stitchinary that talks all about different threads and the different beads you use them with and how they compare to one another <clears throat> I think it's an amazing resource so if you haven't checked out the stitchinary that's a great place to go to kind of familiarize yourself with all the threads and what they do and what beads they fit in all kinds of great stuff like that but <clears throat> Let's get back to the thread at hand, which is the Ceylon. Let me also take a little bit of water because I've been talking so much. Any questions so far? How are we doing, Grace? A lot of people saying hi to Janice when she came up the stairs. All right. A lot of people are saying hi to you, JP. And we had hi's from uh, Denmark and Italy. All right. Hello, Denmark and Italy. Thank you so much for joining us. Awesome. A bunch of different states, too. Mm. Fantastic. All right, well, that little refreshing break, and let's get to looming. So, Gracie, come on up close, and let's take a look at this thread. You guys, Ceylon, here's the micro Ceylon right here. This is what I'm actually doing the warp. I'm sorry, not the warp, the weft, the back and forth. The way that I remember how it's called weft is weft rhymes with right and left. So weft moves under the beads, right and left, and the warp threads that you can see here, I can use either um, regular or fine Ceylon. Either of those will work. Um, you can use the regular Ceylon, which I'm holding here in my left hand, this gray one, or the fine Ceylon, which is this olive one. Depending on which one you use, the bracelet will have a little more weight or heft to it because the regular is a little heavier and the fine is a little bit thinner. Okay, So what I have done is I've strung this or warped this loom. I think I used, I actually used this regular um, Ceylon right here. Can you see that there? It's the regular that I used. So let's pull out um, an, un, I'm jumping ahead a little bit with this project. Let me actually um, go back a step 
and let's talk about the jewel loom. Now, Juliana, um, uh, you may know her as Juliana Huggins. Uh, you also may know her as Juliana Avalar, uh, but she is the fantastic creator of this jewel loom. And you could probably know her though and her all encompassing name, which is Jules. And Juliana um, is a great uh, seed beater, a great loomer, has been doing, has been in the business, I think, even longer than I have. Um, and uh, she is the inventor and creator of this jewel loom by Beadalon, um, which is a great, great tool. And for years, I've been wanting to use it. And finally, I said, I'm getting my jewel loom out and I am looming. And it's really set me off on this whole new creative tangent. So let me show you guys. I, I heard from several comments from you guys during our last live broadcast um, and beyond that you had a jewel loom that's just still sitting in the package in your craft room or on your dining room table waiting for you to open it. So today is the day, you guys. So let me show you. We just, um, there are instructions included, but if you go to the, um, oh yeah, question, Gracie? Would Eslon be too thick for looming? That's a really good question. Eslon, I think, is a little bit thicker. It's a little bit of a heavier thread, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, if Eslon, if your bead holes are large enough and your beads are weighty enough, you should be fine. I really just tailor the size of my threads, like smaller threads to smaller beads, and then larger threads to larger beads. So if your beads are pretty big and you can do a little tester, you should be fine. It'll hold up um, similar to uh, Ceylon because it's also a nylon thread. So let's bust this puppy open here, right? Let's free the jewel loom, free the jewel loom. Let's get this sucker out, out of here. Um, someone okay, says, we go. guilty, yes, I need to remove my loom from the box still. <laughs> right? So look at this. I'm removing. There it is. It's free. <laughs> it's out. Um, so as I was saying, the Jewel Loom comes with a great little instruction folder. But you guys, on our Jewel Loom page on beadshop.com, we've linked Juliana's video that she did about how to work with this. And it's a great, super... Um, instructional video. So you can just pop right over to beadshop.com, put Jewel Loom um, in the search box, or it's listed on our tools tab. You'll find it there. So the wonder of this loom, you guys, is, you know, when you're doing flat loomed work, there's two things. You can't ever get that darn tension right, right? My threads are either too loose or too tight, whatever. And there's nowhere, nowhere to put your hand to grab onto the loom. So the jewel loom solves both of those problems. First, to warp the loom, see how there's this little bar with the little um, standy up ends? And there's a couple of holes right in the jewel loom. Now this jewel loom is made of a flexible plastic and you know, our webmaster Karen, when she first took her jewel loom out of the box, she was all, oh my God, Kate, am I gonna break this loom? Am I gonna break it? Well, the answer is no. The um, uh, the plastic is made to be super flexible. So what I do is I start by putting the little end of that um, metal rod in that hole in the jewel loom. And now I'm just gonna bend the loom, bend it, bend it, and put that guy in the other end so you can see how the loom is bowed, just like that. And check it out, you guys. I can just hold it. It has a great handle to hold as I'm working or if I need to move it around, it's easily portable. Also, you guys, it's super light and you can totally loom. If you guys have Thanksgiving trips coming up and you know as well as I do, if you're flying around Thanksgiving, you're gonna be delayed. You can just take this with you and loom your time away right in the airport. Or you can grab a couple and loom with your family. You know, your kids, nieces, nephews, your grandkids would have a great time. I'm planning to do this with my nieces over um, the holidays. We'll see if I'm successful. So um, let's, well, they're pretty crafty. They'll be able to do it, right? What, why am I naysaying my nieces? Sorry, you guys, You're, you, you've got this. Um, so let's start um, warping this sucker, okay? Super easy to do. I'm gonna use my regular um, Ceylon. No, sorry, yeah, regular Ceylon. Or you could also use 
fine Ceylon here, whatever works. I'm actually, since this is going to be, um, I'm going to start with a different color, I'll use this um, sage. This is the sage regular here. And I'm going to come in, and also you guys, it also depends on how much thread you want to see in your project. Thicker threads are going to give you more visible thread in your finished piece. Thinner threads, your threads will be less noticeable. Um, again, I could do the same thing with Hana, but we're going to go for this thread here. I'm going to turn this sucker around, and can you see that little button that's there? What I'm going to do is I'm going to tie a little overhand knot, right, so there's a loop, and I'm going to come in and secure it around the button. And now I'm going to turn that overhand knot into a square knot by tying one more of those right on top, and then I'm going to tighten everything down. You can have your little tweezers here to kind of help you tighten if you need to. Tighten everything down so it's secure and caught around that button. You guys were halfway home. It's super easy. All we do here is I'm going to come in and can you see from the back how I'm holding this thread? If I'm going to make a bracelet um, that is going to fit in this clasp, I've measured earlier that seven strands across or seven beads are going to be what I need for my project. So seven beads, you guys, mean eight wraps of the thread. You always need one more thread than you need bead, or than you have bead. So see how I've come all the way across? And see how there's a little channel right there, you guys, that holds my thread? Now I'm going to come around the back. See that? I'm going to loop it around the button, and I'm going to come back in. And Gracie, see if you can show them how I'm just coming in and see how I've skipped one of the channels? The cool, other cool thing about this is, this loom is, you can work with any size bead with ease. See, this is the shadows bead that I'm going to be using a little bit later. And see how if I skip one, the channel that's left by the thread is the perfect size. If I were using a larger bead, I could skip two channels, right? Or, like Karen did with her size 11s, she needed a skinny channel, so she just used this fine, just didn't skip any at all. But with these shadows, I'm going to skip one. All right? Now I'm going to go all the way back down, and it's going to meet on the other side. And see, turning it over, securing it around the button, and coming back. Now, you guys, you really don't have to, I'm not really pulling this thread all that tight. It's taut, you know, there isn't slack in it, but I'm not, you know, gritting my teeth, freaking out. But what I did do, take a look there, you guys, I did skip. See, there's actually two channels, so I'm just gonna use my tweezers to move that one channel over and move that one channel over. Quick question. Yeah, Please. question. What can you make what can you make sure the threads are sewn in place? One of my problems is the threads will not be sewn down and I don't know until it's removed. So sewn down meaning your when you add or take away a thread? Give me a little bit of clarification on that. Okay, I'll let you know. Okay, because I'm going to, um, I'll show you how to add and take threads away as well. Some of that, though, I think comes down to having the tension right in your beadwork as you're looming. And getting the tension right when you're stringing your loom, if you can get that right, the tension, you're nine-tenths of the way there. That's the main problem, I think, when you encounter... If your threads are loose in the warp in the weft, then your beads aren't great. But the jewel loom takes a lot of that guesswork out. Yeah. What question, happens if you miss a bead while you're looming? That's a really good question. Um, hold that thought. Don't let me forget, and I'll address that in a second because there is something actually that you can do. Um, so let's count my channels or count my threads. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I've got eight of them, right? So you can see I've ended. Can you see the back there, you guys? I'm going to come in with my trusty um, thread snips. These are new on our website. They're by Zuron. 
Um, and you guys, by the way, I know that some of you, if you're taking notes or whatever during this session, you don't really need to. I've recapped this actually up on our Facebook blog, the bead or our bead shop blog, the bead table. Um, I'll uh, publish it right after we finish going live here, and there'll be a list of all the stuff that I've used in this broadcast. So don't stress about, oh my gosh, I can't remember. I'm gonna have to watch this again and again. So just relax, put those pencils down, um, and I'll I'll publish that up for you. Yeah, Chris, okay, crazy so question. That, um, after sewing beads on that I see thread is not sewn through, but I don't know until removing it from the loom. Maybe that's kind of oh, so when, I see, when you're going back and forth with the warp and the weft, and you've maybe missed a thread, uh, missed a bead, and you see the thread lying on top of the bead. I bet that's what you mean. Um, stick with me and I'll answer that question as I start to add beads to this thread. So with these thread scissors, these are great with, from Zeron. They're um, serrated, so they kind of catch the thread and you can come in and just clip it really tight. Also, it has this super fine point right here, so when I come in and clip my threads away, I can get in there up nice and close. Um, Zeron is a company out of Maine here in the U.S., um, and they're um, really a quality, quality tool. We love them, um, our good friends at Zeron. So, you guys, I'm going to show you how I secure this thread. See here how I've wrapped around that button just like I did to start? I'm going to get the end of my thread, pass it under all of these threads here. See how I have that little bridge of thread there? I'm going to tie, this is called a half hitch. I'm going to tie a half hitch and come down and just tighten it there. And I'm going to tie another half hitch right on top of that just to secure it. <laughs> Zoe asks if the tool works on wire too. Hey Zoe Pie! Um, Zoe Pie is a former bead shop employee, um, so she knows this looming really well. Um, good question, Zoe. These actually are just for um, thread. Uh, we keep these just for thread, so they'll be nice and tight, but great catch. You don't want to actually use these on your wire or you'll dull them. So I'm going to just cut a little bit of this away, just like that, so you can see here's where I started the loom warp, and here's where I ended. Now you guys, check it out. See what I did here? See how I caught it around this, um, this little peg right here? It actually should be tied around this button. So I'm not going to freak out about it. I'm going to take this out and then I'm going to check the tension of my threads. If they're not quite bright, I'm actually going to um, catch it with this thread. I'll show you what I do. That's totally repairable. So here I am to the front and I can feel, I can feel there's a little bit of bounce there, not super tight, but I'm gonna come in and remove this center. Um, one side kind of always removes a little bit easier than the other. So I'm gonna remove this center. Let me try it from this side. There we go. See how it pulls right out? And now it pulls right out from that side. Now where it was you know, kind of funny over here, remember how it was caught around this little end? I don't really think, since these knots are tied pretty tightly, but just in case, I can come in, see with this tail, I'm going to kind of bring this around and maybe just wrap it a couple of times, make sure you guys can kind of see it. Just to secure it, there we go, I like the looks of that, and I'll bring this under. I'll grab my tweezers so my fingers don't block the way. And I'll solve that problem just with another doubled over half hitch. Right? Can we use this loom with wire? I don't see why not. You know, I have actually been wanting to play with wire and this loom, and I haven't yet, but these are my suspicions. Um, and Juliana, if you're watching, I know you said you were going to watch chime in and let us know if you've played with wire on this loom. What I would do is I would make the warp a fairly fine gauge, like maybe 26. And I may, after I warp it, I may keep this bar in place because with the wire, since it's pretty stiff, I don't need kind of the tension to kind of automatically kind of boing in place when I take this back or this piece out, but I'd have to test it. 
but again, I would say maybe 26 for the warp, um, and then maybe 26, 28, 30 gauge, whatever for the weft. Okay. Um, uh, one other question. Yeah. You still have to, uh, you still have thread ends to weave in the loom, correct? I do. Well, I'm going to show you. That's actually great. Hi, Ed. It's our mailman, Ed. Look at, isn't it live? Say hi to everybody, Ed. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, that's a really great question. You're going to see that on the sample, um, how I deal with these, the threads at the end of the warp and then the threads at the end of the weft. So hold that thought. So, yes, so back to just putting a, a finishing touch on the wire. I think it would be totally possible to use wire. And if you guys out there watching um, get to wire before I do, let me know how it goes for you. So see how I popped this out, you guys? And this has given me, feel you know, it's like bouncing a quarter right off a mattress, you know, off a, a fine sheet on a mattress. It's already, this is has an automatic tension. And this is the thing I always struggled for years trying to figure out with looming, how to get this tension exactly right. So now we're ready to jump in. And I'm going to show you how I put the first um, bead, um, uh, warped beads on this weft. And then we're going to jump over to this finished project product. So what I've got here, you guys, are our regular shadow beads. Now, again, this, you can use it for seed beads, you know, any kind of small bead, even gemstones that have generous holes, um, fire polish beads, anything like that, as long as what you're looming is fairly the same size in width. They don't have to be the same size in length, but width they do, meaning that they fit the same going across in the little channels of thread. Yep. Can you remind our viewers that this video will be available later? Yes, thank you, Grace, for reminding and Linda me. Linda is the one who oh, asked. Oh, thanks, Linda, yes, um, it will. You know, these videos are going to be archived on our Facebook page. There's a little, um, whether you're on mobile or your iPad or your laptop or desktop, there is a tab that says videos when you're on the Facebook page, our beadshop.com Facebook page. If you click on there, I've made a folder that says Facebook Live, and you'll be able to view these anytime that you want um, right there from, uh, from our Facebook. So you can see me again and again and again. So let's cut this strand uh, with our trusty little thread scissors here. And let's pull these off and let me show you the size that these regular shadows have. Let me get my little triangle bead tray here. This is what I use to wrangle all of my beads. And I'm just gonna throw them right down in there. Can you guys see this hole? That's a pretty generous hole size, which is why we're using um, such larger thread, um, sturdy thread. Um, so I'm gonna grab where I warped with the regular Ceylon. I'm gonna do my weft with the micro Ceylon. And so I don't work with a length of thread that's so crazy long. I'm going to use my jewel loom to help me measure. And I'm going to go one, two, maybe three lengths of thread. That seems reasonable. And cut this away. Now, remember for the Hana and the Kao, the smaller threads, how I use these jewel loom needles, these smaller ones? For this project, you guys, we're using big eye needles. And we're doing that because the thread is larger and the hole in the um, bead looming needles is a little small. So the big eye needles are just that. If you haven't used them before, can you see there's three different sizes in here, two of each, the small, the medium, and the large. And I have, it looks like I have the medium size here, but any of these really will work. And it's called a big eye, you guys, because when I spread it open, there's the whole eye of the needle, right? So I'm not spending all day trying to thread this sucker. So all I do is I get my micro Ceylon, I bring it in. Now what I do is I pull it just so I have, I don't know, maybe about three inches of tail there or so. And see how I pull it all the way down to the end of my thread or end of my, the eye of the needle, see how it just locks it in there. That thread's not going anywhere. So it's safe and secure and won't pull out of the eye. So let's go ahead and start. I'm gonna pull seven beads, you guys, off of my strand of shadows. I've got 
three, and I don't unstrand them. I think it's easiest to do it this way. I've got three, four, five, six, seven. I take those seven, make sure it's seven. There we go. I hold them between my thumb and my um, index finger, and I'm right-handed, you guys, so I'm holding my needle in my dominant hand. I just thread that needle right through these shadows, just like that. Thread them down my C-Lon, and I give myself a little bit of a tail down here, again, about that same three inches. Now, the question earlier was, when I take my beads off the loom, and I see that I have threads that I didn't catch. Well, this is the way that you're gonna make sure that you don't make that mistake. So see, I come up from the bottom and I just pop each of these little shadows or whatever bead you're using right into its little home and I come back in with the needle. The thread is on the bottom here. Now I'm coming up with the needle on the top and I'm pushing the needle up, you guys, as I'm doing this so I can feel the top of the bead hole but I also know that I'm not going from underneath because I'm not raising any of these warp threads. Does that make sense? As I pull it up I can see that I'm not, if I were doing that and I pulled it up, see how I'd be pulling up this thread and taking it out of order but instead as I do that if I touch the little rooftops of the beads I make sure that I'm not catching my thread, um, a warp thread, inadvertently. So let me put those all back in their little channels, touch the top of the bead hole with my needle, or the, the channel of the bead hole. I can feel the top of the bead right there, and let me slide these little bad boys right into place. Slippery little buggers, right? There we go. And I just push them up with my index finger if I push up with my index finger and push down on my warp threads at the same time, I kind of create, open that little channel up so my needle just sings, just slides right through. And if my tail isn't quite long enough, I'm going to pull it out at this point so I have a little more leader there. Now I'm just going to pull this all the way through, and there's my first set of beads that are locked in. Okay? Now, once you get past the first couple of rows, you guys, um, things get a little bit easier. Um, I'm going to use these three millimeter beads next, and uh, the pattern that I've got going on, you can see this one that I've been working on. You can see it's a row of shadows and then a row of shadows um, broken up by a three millimeter bead. So let's get these three millimeter beads going. This. Um, I have the name, the color name of all of these threads that I'm using. I have it listed on our blog. I think this is the, Gracie, do you remember the color of this guy? Of these, those are those like... Those are moon dust. Moon dust. Picasso moon dust. Three millimeters. So you can see I put my three on, my moon dust. Krista says, I've missed your periscope, Kate. Oh, thanks, Krista. You know, I do some periscoping from my jewelry studio um, with my metalworking, um, and I'm going to be getting back to those. It's been such a hectic summer and fall um, that I just haven't had the time, but I'm so glad you're watching me here uh, on Facebook Live doing some beadwork, but you'll we'll get back to some metalworking on periscope <laughs> as well. So see you guys how I've just pushed those up from the bottom, pull my thread through, and also if my thread really glides through easily, then I know that my thread is on the right path. Can you see on this side, you guys, how the thread comes around and goes underneath, and that's how we lock this, um, this strand right in place. Now again, with my index finger, pushing the beads up, my thumb pushing the warp threads down, and I touch the top of the bead hole with my needle. This little center bead, since the hole's a little smaller, might give me a little more sass, but I do the same thing there, and I just keep sliding it through. Okay. Now, you may notice, um, I didn't mention it, but you actually may notice, see how I'm working in the center of the loom? You guys, I start most of my beaded projects, whether it's loomed work or if it's those freeform peyote stitch beads or a necklace, I like to start in the middle because the most important part of what you're making, your finished piece, 
the part that's going to be seen the most is the center, right? So if you're kind of doing this on the fly, like I like to do sometimes, starting from the middle so you can get what's going on in the middle, um, get that solidified, then you can kind of, you know, make things up as you go along and you can kind of add a little bit to one end and add a little bit to the other. That way you're not starting from one end and if you make things too long, you have to rip it back to center it and everything. So just start from the middle and work your way um, to the right and to the left. Yeah, question? Do you ever use a contrasting color for either the warp or the weft? Yeah, you sure could. And you can see this This is pretty much a contrasting color here with this silver. I could have used gray, which I actually use a lot. But I'm just in love with this sage green. Um, so I'm just going to keep going with it because I really like it. Um, let's put this one aside, though. I would continue to weave up here. Um, and then I'd add another thread. And the way that I'd simply add a thread, let's just say um, that my thread, I've had a bunch of stuff here, I've ended a thread, so I'm going to just cut it. And if I go ahead and I add a new thread, I'll come in back in my warp, or my weft rather. And again, these beads have such large holes, and I can just get it on through and I'll have a couple of long tails that I can weave back through later and I'll start a little further back you know from where I want my beads to be so I've weaven weaven let's try that again I've woven that in and now I'm just ready to add another um, another row I've got my three I've got my moon dust so your threads will be visible on the finished project um, they probably will. The warp and weft threads will be slightly more visible than they would be if the color matched. But again, I'm someone who likes their thread to show. So it will show a bit, and I just think of it as an enhancer to the design. If you want your threads to show less, use threads that are finer, you know? If you want your threads to show more, use threads that are thicker. Okay, so see that? I'm just coming through, and now I'm just going to keep going down with my loom work. Later on, what I'll do, I'll just come back in, and I could even thread both of these needles, um, or both of these threads, rather, through the big eye. And sometimes I, wind, I um, weave my tails in as I go along. Because as you guys know, weaving tails in is such a pain in the butt, right? If you're a knitter, if I have any knitters out there, it's the same thing about weaving your, your knitting threads in. I try and weave them in as I go. Because sometimes that feels like such a daunting task at the end. Let me get this long one through and I'll come back in with that shorter one. But see how it just comes right through here. Whoops, I'm taking it out. Huh. Let's just pretend that it was... Let me just put that through there. The beauty of live television, folks. Live television, live video. Let me put that back through. But you get the idea here. And I'm going to weave it off on that side also. So let me just get it back through on this one. And this guy here. Tighten that warp thread. And if, you know, if your threads start to get kind of tight in your bead holes, I just have my chain nose plier. That can help me gently tug on my needle as well to pull things through. So let's put this guy aside and let's get to this one um, so I can actually wrap things up and show you how to finish this sucker off. So you can see we're going to talk about this end in a minute, how we'd finish off those warp and weft threads. But this one just needs um, a couple more um, rows. So I'm going to actually finish this guy off. This is where I ended a thread and this is where I added a thread. So it's coming out, can you see it's coming out of that bead hole there. So I'm just going to pop down one and I can weave it through like these three from this side and always turning a corner is a good way to lock your threads in. So see how I've turned that corner? I'm going to turn that corner one more time to make a little rectangle. 
There's someone just joining. She's yeah. asking uh, what the brand of the loom is. Oh, it's called the Jewel Loom. And what you can do after we're done with this broadcast, you'll be able to pop over to the beadshop.com um, blog, the bead table, and there'll be a listing of everything that I used. Um, but for now, there it is, the Jewel Loom. And you can find it right on our website. So I'll just keep going along. <clears throat> A little bit I'll send it under that three millimeter and then maybe back through here so this is woven back pretty well um, and then what I'll do is I'm gonna pull this thread kind of tight can you see where it's coming out from that bead I'm gonna get this is where these thread snips you guys really come in handy I'm gonna pull it pretty tight clip and that little end just pops back in there never to be seen again. Um, Diana asks, does too many end threads weave back through and make the integrity of the, of the bracelet less strong? Will, the, will they tend to become loose? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, my guess is you won't have more than maybe four or five ends in. I mean, a bracelet this long, I usually only have to add thread maybe twice, maybe. Um, and the threads, as long as when you end a thread, I always jump back a little bit and add my thread back a little. So you have sometimes in a bead hole a sandwich or of you know three or four or five threads. So it's not going to really affect the integrity of the thread. It's not like you're ending one thread here and starting another thread here where they could pull apart. You're kind of starting a thread here, weaving it back up, and then ending a thread by weaving it back down. So there's a little bit of an overlap, if that makes sense. So here at the end, I've put my needle back on the end here and I'm gonna finish up. I've got two more rows to do um, of this guy. And I'm gonna show you, I'll, I'll jump back and show you how I measure this um, in just a second. You know, for looming, it's always, I think it's kind of a crapshoot, right? How do you figure out how to get a loomed bracelet the exact right length that you need it to be? And depending on the kind of clasp that you use, like if you use a tube clasp or something like that, um, you can add a little rosary loop or you know vary the size of your um, clasp that you're using. But on this piece, what we're doing today is we're using a clasp that has a specific length that's not adjustable. So we've really got to be right on with our measurements. So I'm going to show you how I do that. Again feeling the top of those bead holes to make sure that I'm catching um, all of the all of the interior of the bead and not the warp threads. And let's do one last row, two, four, six, seven. Finishing it as I started it, you can see right here I started with a plain row, so I want to finish with a plain row. I'm going to come back through. See how easy it is to just flip this loom right around and it's a nice space to get my whole hand under there to work. Push these suckers right up in the little channels where they go. Push up with my index finger, down with my thumb to really expose that hole and I just fly my needle right through the holes of the bead and pull that back. All right, so now I just want to weave this off because I want to end this right here. So I'm going to go back, see if I can get that through. And again, these generous bead holes allow me to really get that thread through. And I'll go back here, maybe one more, maybe I'll only go half the row. Lock the thread in by completing a little rectangle or a little square all the way around. <clears throat> I've seen people using half hitch knots when weaving the ends in the project. Pro or con? Is it necessary, do you think? Oh, it's a really good question. I, okay, for my school of knotting is I, for weaving, I would say no. Because if you're locking your square back in around and doing some little back in and around steps, I think that 
half hitch knot is just going to get in the way and make your piece look bulky. I do use a half hitch knot in this piece and I'm going to show you where I use it as an ending thread. But I would say as long as your threads are securely woven back a ways, you're going to be fine. Now here's a little trick that you may want to do, um, and I think this is controversial in the weaving world, um, but I love glue. I just do. Um, and I think glue will really help us to secure this thread. Now, I'm not going to use a lot of glue, and it will help me just to secure this thread down in here. Um, you don't have to use glue, but I'm going to use glue here just to show you um, kind of an alternate way. See here uh, how I have a little plastic baggie? I'm using this Zap really fast drying glue with a really fine tip. I'm going to take the lid off and I'm going to just put a little touch of glue there and I'm going to spread that glue. Less is more with this, you guys. I've opened up a little paper clip to saturate that thread with glue. I'm going to pull the thread up and off because I don't want to get this glue on my beads. I'm going to send this thread through and really, really carefully, you guys, slide that glued thread back in there and then maybe slide it back one more time. Now, I haven't used so much glue that I'm making this, war uh, this weave stiff. I'm not getting my glue and shoving it in there, you know, after it's been loomed. I'm just putting the tiniest amount of glue on my final thread that goes through. This way, when I come in, I'm going to pull it through one more time. I'm going to come in, I'm going to clip, and I have all the confidence in the world that that thread's going to stay. Okay? So that's how I end it. Now, let's get up here close and personal, Grace, so you can see how I've ended this piece. Let's um, kind of jump back to measuring and how would I figure out what length to make this piece. So the clasp that I'm using, this is our cornerstone clasp and it is a, um, you can see a magnetic clasp that's super strong. It also is about an inch in length. Can you see that? So we have to take into account how much room this clasp is going to take up when this is a bracelet. You know, when you're making a necklace, it's not as dire to measure your necklace so it's right on unless it's like a choker or something where you really want it to sit perfectly. But with a bracelet, you've got to be right on because if you make that bracelet too long, it's going to just fall right off your wrist. So we need to be really conscious about how we're going to do this. So what I've done is I've taken a piece of paper, you guys, just a little strip, and I've, I've cut it out and I measured my wrist so that I know door to door the finish length, and you can see I've got a little bit of space, you can see there's a little bit of space there. Door to door, my bracelet needs to measure seven and a quarter inches. And I measured out this piece of paper. So that's the finish length of my bracelet. So now I'm gonna lay my clasp on here and I'm gonna lay my piece of paper. Well, first I'll lay my piece of paper on here from the end of where my beads go. You're just ignoring this little warp down here. And I lay my clasp on and I can see that that length all the way down, it's exactly seven and a quarter. Okay, so I know, so I just loomed this, took into consideration the length of my clasp. You could even mark it on here. I could even come in and say, okay, this is where my clasp ends. So, and this is where my beads need to begin. Someone loves the clasp, thinks it's beautiful. Right? Isn't this amazing? It's a nice hefty clasp. I really, really love these. And we have them in the three different, um, in the three different flavors. I just dig them so, so much. So to, to use a clasp like this on a loomed piece, there was a question earlier about, well, what about the warp threads, Kate? Are you going to weave those suckers back in? And actually, we don't. Um, this is a similar way um, as we finish our tapestry project. And you can go to, after this broadcast, our tapestry um, 
project on our project page, click on any one of the projects and that project PDF on those projects. The, um, uh, the PDF handout will pop up and if you go to page 8, that's where this uh, describes uh, how to finish this. It's also on the blog post as a quick link for your reference so you don't have to take notes on this. But what we do, it's a really ingenious way that we have of um, finishing off bigger loomed pieces. So can you see you guys here how when I measured for my warp threads, I matched it up so that the width of my loomed piece will be the same width as my clasp. But can you see how the interior channel, you guys, right here, how this interior channel is smaller, isn't as wide as these warp threads? So when I weave these threads in, I'm going to have to make little hips on these guys. Pull these in just a little so that my finished loomed piece is going to fit right inside this channel. Let me show you. Here's a finished one, and I'm going to show you how I do it. But can you see with these little warps how I pulled it in nice and tight there? So eventually that end is what's going to slide into this clasp. So let me show you how I did it. I think it's a really ingenious way um, of closing off pieces like this. So I get my trusty big eye needle one more time. But this time, you guys, instead of doing this um, weft, this weaving back and forth with just thread, instead of using the fine, I'm sorry, the micro um, cord that I used for underneath the beads, I'm actually going to use my um, regular Ceylon for this. I'm going to clip it. I don't need a long, super long piece, but I'm going to come in and go with my big eye needle and lock it down so my thread doesn't pull out. Now you can attack this one of two ways. The bead holes here, you guys, are really big, so I can just go ahead and weave um, weave through my first row of beads. If the holes weren't so big and it wouldn't take this strand, I could just start weaving on uh, the warp threads this way. But I'm going to go ahead, since these beads have such big, generous holes, you get it through, push up with my index finger, down with my thumb to expose those holes. I'll come through, I'll leave myself a little bit of a tail, and now I'm going to weave just thread over and under the warp threads and I'll do it again here. I'm not worried too much right now about pulling things in tightly. I just want to get a nice row of beads or a nice row of thread but see what I didn't do? So I'm going to take this out because this is a mistake. I want you guys to see this. See how I didn't catch this last row of thread right there? I need to make sure that I come underneath because if I don't catch that thread, it's not going to pull in tightly. So make sure over and under, over and under. There we go. See that? That's how that should look. I didn't quite catch it over here, but when I bring my thread back over, it'll catch that one. So I'm going to do these three rows, one, two, three. Then I'm going to pull things in kind of tight. And this, you guys, if you don't do this, your clasp just isn't going to fit. So see how I'm pulling that in tight? I'm pulling this in. And I'll pull my handy dandy my handy dandy tweezers in there to really help me pull those hips in. There we go. Take up some of that slack. And you can also use the tips of your tweezers if any of you do any regular weaving, like on a rigid head of loom or something like that. These little tips, I'm just beating down kind of that, that warp or that weft there. So I'll come in from the bottom, do the same thing over, under, over, under. Can you see now how the channels on the end are a little bit smaller? That's because we've pulled our warp threads, or our warp threads in a little bit more tight. 
with this weft that we're weaving. And I know you're thinking, you're all, well, Kate, how many strands do you weave in there? I'm going to say that you only, you only need to do this about four times, maybe five at the max, because you don't want it to be too long because you want to see, you can kind of see the channel, the length of this channel. You don't want it to be any longer than um, the length of the channel in your clasp. So see, it's a little loosey-goosey, so I'm using the ends of my knotting tweezers as a little beater to push that weft down. You can also use your thumbnail. And I'm going to do this one more time. And then you guys prepared, prepare for greatness. Prepare to be wowed because I think this is such a great way to close. Tighten this sucker down. You're the boss of these threads, you guys. You're in charge. <clears throat> I'm going to come in. This is where I use that half hitch. Remember we talked about a half hitch in the body of the piece? I'm going to come up with my needle. I'll weave to that middle, one of the middle warp threads. Maybe this one. Pull everything tight. Now I'm just going to go around that warp thread with my needle to make a circle with my thread. You see that circle? And just push my needle through there. Whoops, that wasn't quite. Something went wrong. I didn't cross it the right way. Bear with me here just a second. Your thread needs to catch around that warp thread. I come in, make my circle. There we go. And I send my thread through. Tighten everything up. Get those knotting tweezers in there if you need it to pull that warp in. Tighten that bad boy up, you guys. And that knot is sitting just right there. I'm going to tie one more half hitch on the top of that just to secure it. Same place, same bead time, same bead channel, just right there. Okay. Now this end, I'm going to take my needle out. This one here, if I had just started it, right here, I could knot it off, but again, these bead holes, you guys, are so big, they accommodate some weaving back through. So, weaving back through is my default, but I'll knot if I need to. And I could, just like I finished off earlier, with my glue, Use this plastic baggie to protect your fingers and your beads and all that. Just a touch, you guys. Less is more with glue. Get that little paper clip or a toothpick. The finishing techniques, you guys, is what makes your pieces sing. If you've loomed a beautiful piece and they just the string the finishing techniques are just sad, you might as well just stop now. I always say I like to do my loom work or even stringing with a bracelet or a necklace. I like to do all of the design work and stringing work one day and then the next day I'll come in and um, put a clasp on it. You can see also, take a look, there's a little bit of a, a loose thread there but since I've woven it back and forth so much, I'm just going to clip that away and everything should be fine. Same thing here. This one that I've finished off, I'm clipping. Now, a final glue. I've done this to this side earlier, so now I'm going to do it to this side. I get my plastic baggie one more time. I get my glue, and very just with the most careful touch, but with confidence, you guys. You're the boss of this glue, and you're the boss of these beads. I'm going to come in. I'm just going to saturate those threads. See how I'm just barely coming up to where the beads are. 
You do not want a gluey fiasco on your hands, you guys. So with the courage of your convictions, like Julia Child says, when you flip an omelet, you've got to have the courage of your convictions. Kate Richburg says, when you glue, you also need that confidence. Okay? And see how I'm just using this paper clip to push that glue down in there? Can you remind the viewers what glue this is? Yeah, about? thanks for asking. It's the Zap No Drip Gel. And it really does, we use it for gluing everything here. It's great. Uh, and it'll be um, set in about five or ten minutes. Earlier today, I don't know, about maybe an hour ago, I glued this side um, and it's nice and dry and ready to use. So through the, through the magic of video, I have this side here. I'll come in and I'm going to clip that little end away right on top of the knot, just like that. Now, um, you've noticed, you guys, that I've kept this piece on the loom this whole time while I did all of this, so it's easy for me to reach everything. Um, this, it's okay that it's still wet. Um, we're going to go ahead and just cut this sucker right off the loom. The time has come, right? Shall we do it? Shall we do it? Yes. yes, let's do it. Let's cut this sucker off. So I'm going to leave some tails here. I'll actually use, do this side, the dry side. I'll leave some tails, but I'll kind of put my hand, because the bead loom is going to kind of spring back a little bit. So I'm just going to come in and cut. Let's take this sucker mm -hmm. off, and let's take it off the back. We're busy filling your orders. You can hear our, everybody in the background. The hustle and bustle of beadshop.com is going on all around me. So can you see how here the, the um, warp threads, they're not going anywhere. This is firmly glued down on there. Um, so I'm just going to come in and I'm going to give it a little bit of a haircut. I'm going to leave maybe about a sixteenth of an inch at the end. And those ends, can you see, are fairly stiff because there's glue. Now, here's the moment of triumph, you guys. I have no idea whether or not this is going to fit, but, oh my goodness, check it out. It fits just perfectly. So let's glue this sucker in, shall we? And another question. Can sure. you remind us of these cutters, what they are? Yeah, so this is the Zuron Micro Shear. And hang in there, you guys. We're almost to the part where I give you a very special offer. If you want to go do some shopping, you can do some shopping with a great discount. So hang in there. We're almost, we're on our home stretch. Um, so they're the Zuron, I'm sorry, I didn't finish that thought. The Zuron uh, thread, um, thread and cord cutter, I think is what we call them. So let's go ahead and get our glue. Again, carefully on that little warp I made. Again, not too much, you guys. You don't want that glue oozing out at the end. So I'm going to use my, my paper clip. I'm going to turn that bad boy. I'm going to do the back. The other thing that I like about ending with this thick thread, you guys, is that the channel of this clasp is pretty big, so it's going to fill that channel pretty nicely. See that? Use the tip just to get it in there, right up to where the beads go. And can you see how this glue is gel, so it's not falling all over the place, you know? Like if it were super glue, it would just be soup seeping all the way back down into the threads here. But since it's gel, it's staying where I put it. So let's just put this guy firmly in place. And I would leave it, if this were real jewelry making time and real world time, I would let it sit undisturbed for about 10 minutes and then glue the other side. But since I'm a rebel, we're just going to go ahead and glue that other side. I like to think I'm a rebel. I don't know. Um, you know, we always like to think we're, I don't know, bead rebels, right? So I'm going to come in, and already this is set up pretty well, so I'm going to come in and clip it. It's a little tacky, but it's not too bad. And I'm going to come in and give this guy a haircut on this side here. Hey Kate, what is E6000? Could you use it? I feel like E6000 is a little too thick. 
I feel it sets up maybe just a hair too fast. And with the regular E6000 um, dispenser, I don't think I could be quite as um, precise with it. See how I'm just going there with that tip? You can certainly try it. Um, I'll be honest, I'm not really sure how E6000 and metal will live together. My hunch is probably pretty well, um, but there's no harm in trying. You will render your clasp. Um, you want to make sure that your, <coughs> if you're gluing, your clasp is going to be um, nice and tight in there. So just make sure to use kind of a similar amount of glue and spread it around Super easily. Glue. No, super glue is too thin, you guys. Super glue would just be taken up, wicked up by the threads, and just pulled back down into the piece, making like the last half inch of this piece stiff. So I would stay away from super glue. Get a little bit of drink of water because I've been talking at you a long time. We're almost done here. We're on the home stretch, so thanks so much for sticking in with me, sticking, sticking through this demo with me. All right, so I'm just going to come in for our final trick. Get that guy right in there. Your tweezers can help you. Just be really careful not to get glue all over everything. And check it out, you guys. Come on now. How cute is this piece? Pretty darn cute. I'm going to put this aside so I don't glue it to my hand. And I'm going to be really careful because it's still a little wet. Can I get this clasp is so strong I can't get it apart. Let me see. Bam. I'm not going to turn it around, but you guys can see. The clasp looks great just on the front. And look, you guys, it fits. What? Who? I have a pretty average size wrist, so seven and a quarter fits me just perfectly. Let me model this for you awesome so you guys thank you so much for sticking with me um i can't take this off so i'm just going to gingerly move my arm around as i finish up here um i have a list on our blog like i said earlier about the different beads um that you can use we've got shadows in brass we've got shadows in the antique silver um i picked out some beads that I think look great with it. But you know, you guys, use your imagination. Let your imagination go wild uh, with the um, color combinations um, that you use. You can, you know, kind of improvise and, and, and find the colors that you like. Let me see if I can get this sucker off. This actually fell out the end. So I'm going to take that as a moment to put it in there and let it sit undisturbed. It's super tempting to put these suckers on right away. But what I would do um, if I were making this at home, I would let this just sit undisturbed for 24 hours and then it'll be good for you guys to wear. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things, you guys. You've been waiting and sticking with me this whole time, which I super appreciate. What's the name of the clasp real quick? Oh, the clasp is called the Cornerstone. It's Cornerstone clasp. You can just pop Cornerstone right into the search box on our website. So. For you Facebook Live viewers, you know that on our website we do have some discount codes that you can use. However, we are offering a 25% off discount on everything in your cart that you purchase. It expires. You've got to shop fast. It ends tomorrow night, Thursday, uh, 1027 at midnight Pacific time. But if you enter 25 Live in the coupon code box, uh, upon checkout, you'll get 25% off your entire order, which, huh, come on, amazing, amazing. Also, the first 10 people, I feel like that Bob Dylan sign, right? Or, right? And next, first 10 people, 10 customers who write, I want my free needles in the notes section of your, um, of the checkout box we'll send you a free pack of big eye needles okay but it's the first 10 we have them sitting over there on the shipping desk and when we end with those 10 needles they're gone they're gone you can certainly purchase some but the um, first 10 orders having this note you have to put this note in you guys i want my free needles and we'll add them to your order 
lastly, you guys, if you have any questions at any time, you can find me, email me anytime at kate at beadshop.com. I'll be glad to answer your questions. You can also pop your questions right in the comments after this broadcast to all go in and answer some of your questions. Again, this broadcast is going to be aired, um, archived on our Facebook, uh, beadshop.com Facebook page. You can shop 24-7 at beadshop.com. Check out our projects. We have some great projects. I mentioned that stitchinary earlier to talk a little bit more about threads. Um, and finally, a sneak peek for next week. Such a mess on the table, I don't know where it is. We're going to be talking two hold beads, you guys. This is a piece that Janice did, and these are super duos, and there are new super duo duets. Can you see the color change when I hold it this way and when I hold it this way? Pretty amazing, and we're going to be laddering with them. True twos and the new super duo duets. That's what's coming up next Wednesday. All right, you guys. Holy cow. I got through our first Facebook Live. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm Kate Richburg for BeadShop.com. We'll see you next time. And what we like to say around here at the Bead Shop and at BeadShop.com, don't worry, be happy. We'll see you soon.